Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. We'll begin in probably like five minutes. Hello. Hey, Tan. Hey. Gotcha. You want to test the screen? Let me get off mine. No, no. I mean, yes. Okay. Let me see. Works. Looks good. Again, thank you for coming, everyone. That's uh, an exciting topic. Obviously, we have uh, we have a really nice program planned. Wait a few minutes, maybe. We'll start in like another one to two minutes. People are still coming in. If you have any questions, you could type in this in the chat window or uh, speak up. Um, we'll have a presentation by Etan 
followed by some cases. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a few more people came. Um, why don't we go ahead and start? And um, this is recorded, so of course, if you know somebody who missed it, just let them know. It's going to be on YouTube a little bit later. Eitan, thank you so much. It's a lot of work. It's a big presentation. Uh, Eitan's been working for a while on this and it's a, really a, a compilation of the current state of what we know anatomically and what is possible to do in the orbit um, in various interventions. Eitan, thank you very much. All right. You see my screen, you see me and you hear me? Yeah, we're good. All right, good. Okay, so um, thank you for um, uh, giving me the opportunity to like uh, um, look more into details about this topic, which is actually fascinating. Um, so um, little disclosure, nothing really relevant for for this uh, talk. Um, let's talk. Let's start about like recognizing the giants for this topic. Obviously, we start with Paget or uh, Dorcas Paget, like who describe like the embryology of the system in a way that is still like uh, completely relevant. And then uh, uh, Jacqueline Vigneault, who's, uh, we, we usually don't uh, uh, talk about her much in neuro interventional work, but uh, she actually contributed a lot in terms of uh, 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 neuro, neuroradiology general and uh, neurovascular description in the 70s. And she actually taught both La Jonia and Moray. She was, uh, she was their mentor. And she passed away, uh, sadly, just a couple of years ago obviously Pierre Lajonia, um, and then uh, uh, Jacques Moret and, and, uh, and Sohan Hire were still alive and, uh, and they, they also contributed a lot in this. Sohan Hire is an ophthalmologist from India. Like if you look into this topic, you'll see, you're, you'll see like a lot of articles about the uh, supply to the orbit that are made by, uh, by him. So um, I will not start with embryology, I will start with a descriptive anatomy and then talk also about something that we don't spend a lot in radiology talking about, which is the more like this, the anatomy of the nerve, the retina and the choroid. The reason why we don't do that is because these territories are really like so visible from the outside. To, and so it's the ophthalmologist who, who is like the one that mainly deals with them. Then I will move to the embryology and talk about the variants. So trying to understand the variants based from the embryology. And, uh, and then I will finish with a little veins. I will put some cases in between, uh, uh, cases that are relevant to describe certain topic. So starting from a brief overview, like we have the ophthalmic artery coming from the ICA, and the ophthalmic artery takes a, a turn around the nerve, it gives some, uh, some, uh, uh, some vessels to the, to the globe, which are the ciliary and the retinal artery. And then when take, taking a, a, a turn, a turn toward, toward the medial side, we'll, go, we'll give also a lacrimal artery that goes laterally, and then the medial, Continuation, the continuation of the ophthalmic artery media will give like, uh, will end at the level of the nose. Now we're gonna go much more in detail about this, uh, this anatomy. So, starting from the origin of the ophthalmic artery, um, um, the, um, the, the caliber of the, of the, of the artery is, is between 0 0.7 and 1.4 millimeter. And this has been studied extensively with very, very good, both cad cad uh, uh, mainly cadaveric, uh, uh, cadaveric studies. Um, the most common origin 
it, there are different kind of origin, different lo possible location of origin. This is a sagittal view. You can think of it as sagittal view of the ICA. This is just the same drawing, like or, or organized in a same, similar way, but it shows like four possible origins of the ophthalmic artery from the ICA. And um, as you see here, you can recognize like this is, these are the two dural ring, the distal dural ring and the proximal dural ring. So you can see like there's an origin which is purely interdural, which is here named A. And then there's an origin which is really at the roof of the cavernous sinus, this B that starts really at, at, the, cavernous, at, the, cavernous, at the roof of the cavernous sinus. Then we have C, which is like an origin within the dural rings in a space that we should call actually inter, interdural. And then we have uh, like a pure extradural origin like D. When we think about the origin of the ophthalmic artery, type B, so which is like essentially at the roof of the cavernous sinus is the most common, more than 50% of the cases uh, have the origin there. And uh, so mentioning briefly about the dual rings, uh, the, uh, the, here you have a, probably what I think is the best image to understand is in which uh, we see the, the, the dual like here dividing into two leaflets and, uh, and uh, these leaflets cre uh, create like this sort of like a space, which is an interdural space, is in between the dura. So it's, it's actually not proper to call this subdural, also because when, when we think about the subdural, we correlate that with pathology. This is like interdural space, a space in between the dural leaflets. Here you see the origin of the ophthalmic artery. This obviously uh, is it's, uh, it's, um, uh, uh, going, so it is the left eye if we think of it in an axial view, and then uh, it goes here and then it pierces, uh, it pierces this dura and continues along with the nerve. When we try to apply this anatomy to the angiography, and that these are, this is work from a, a Max that is, is uh, both on, on, on the website but also published to try to give a, a new classification, and he did this in, a, in 2012. Um, like, you, you can spend a lot of time trying to understand exactly where the dual rings is, but essentially the bottom line is that uh, from an angiographic perspective, you, you, we cannot visualize either ring. So you can imagine more or less where are the rings. And, um, and, um, and by looking at the anterior clinoid and at the sphenoid sinus, you can imagine where are the rings, but you, you cannot see them uh, angiographically. But also on the MRI, it's, it's, it's not possible. Um, in terms of lateral to medial, the site of origin is actually anterior medial. And uh, here you see this uh, beautiful image again from Hyre that shows like the anterior medial point of origin it would be like a, a left uh, internal carotid artery here. And, um, and um, now we can try to understand very well the course with the beautiful Dyna CTs that we can obtain as part of our routine angiography, in this case in a patient with a, with a meningioma. And, uh, and we can really like see how um, this is really like the most common, the most common origin, this uh, anterior medial to the, uh, compared to the nerve. And then what happens, uh, the, the artery makes uh, two turns, a little turn initially, like which it's called like technically angle A and then, uh, and then or angle alpha, and then, uh, a, a and then another little turn later on, which is called angle beta. And again, like uh, these, uh, these things, like you can really like uh, see them all in your, in your angiography. Um, Moving forward, uh, uh, once, uh, um, once it, it, it becomes intracanalicular, you can see how the, uh, it tends to stay in fear to the nerve. This is the optic, optic foramen, and you have, the, you have to imagine the optic nerve like large inside, and it stays in fear and, and uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of lateral to the nerve, a, li a little like lateral to the nerve. And uh, uh, this is instead like a, a sagittal image that shows very well its course in fear to the nerve. Uh, this is just the same uh, image representing the, the same concept and, uh, and you can see like how you can imagine the nerve really like overlying on top of uh, your artery. Um, sometimes, very, very rarely, uh, I, I did, don't have a, a, um, a radiological case, uh, so I took one from the literature. There can be like a, a duplication of the, of the optic uh, foramen uh, with a part only for the, for the nerve itself and then a separate channel for the, uh, for the ophthalmic artery. And here it's an example uh, from a, a human skull. Now, uh, moving forward, like it's interesting to analyze the course of the artery compared to the optic nerve. And uh, we can think of the, of the ophthalmic artery here as, as uh, in three, three parts. Like we can think of an initial part that is in relation with the nerve. 
and then uh, a part in which it crosses the nerve and uh, we're gonna see how it can cross above or inferior to the nerve. And, and then a third part that is uh, the continuation of the, of the ophthalmic artery, like medial, like mid to the medial orbit up, up to the nose. Um, in terms of the, um, the crossing uh, uh, compared to the nerve, most of the time, like 82% of the cases go superiorly. And this is something that you can appreciate on any, actually any MRI, any CTA, you can try to understand what kind of, uh, of, of ophthalmic artery uh, you have in your case. Not that it's too relevant, but it's good to like try to go a little further in the understanding of the anatomy. Um, while much, much less, uh, less cases, it's, uh, it's, it, goes, uh, it, goes in fear, it, it bends in fear to the nerve. Now, in, seven, in most of the people though, whatever kind a person has in one side will have it in the other side. So in 75% of people, there will be like a correlation of that. What is uh, fascinating uh, when uh, it's, it's uh, to look at these articles, in this case from uh, Jacqueline Vigneault from uh, the 70s, in which like uh, she uh, analyzed uh, the, the course of the artery compared to the nerve, and remember, they didn't have MRI at that time, uh, um, not even CT, uh, probably. Um, so, like, a lot of work, uh, 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 really, like, geometrical uh, 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 analytic work to understand the course of the ophthalmic in the angiography. Why was it that important? Because that was the only way, really, to understand if there was, like, a mass in, in the eye and to understand where the mass was. So all this work that was done in those years to, to like follow the course of the arteries was very important. And here, for example, she recognizes like a normal, uh, like, sorry, like the, the, the classic supraorbital force like this and how the ophthalmic artery should force on the, on the uh, frontal view, on the lateral view, and what would be on the, on, on the anaxial view, and then the infraorbital course, and then some sort of variant of an infraorbital force. So it's, uh, it's actually interesting to try to apply this, this rule to the, to the current angiograms. And, uh, and I, I, I open a few angiograms and try to recognize it. And it's actually like, it's, it's, it, you're going to find exactly like the course that was described. And for this, again, the supraoptic course in which you have the proximal ophthalmic artery in fear to the nerve, and then it crosses over uh, and then uh, lateral to, to medial crosses over and then, and then becomes medial. And here, here there it is, like in, uh, you see the course. And so you can imagine the optic nerve, nerve really uh, around here. And uh, uh, from, a, from a sagittal point of view, from a lateral point of view, you can uh, recognize the same thing. And uh, you see how there is a curvature, like a, a, a sort of like a uh, rect, rect, uh, uh, 90 degree angle curvature. And this is the point where it crosses the nerve. And uh, this is what has been described as also as the bayonet sign, the sort of like appearance. Now, why is this important? Because we know that the, the, the arteries that goes to the eye, like the ciliary and the retinal arteries will come uh, at or before this, uh, this turn. So that's why it becomes important to recognize. Now, keep in mind though, that when there's the infraoptic type, and this is like the images from, uh, from uh, Jacqueline Vigneault, uh, you're not gonna see that sort of like uh, acute angle. What you're gonna see instead is this sort of like on the ladder, you're gonna see this sort of continuation, right? So, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, um, you have, we have to be careful in case we have to investigate where the uh, important arteries come from in this sort of anatomy. And you see again the turn and you see this sort of more like acute angle. And look at how, how really like uh, uh, very, very uh, similar to that image we see the course. Now, moving forward to a case, so let's take a little break uh, and, and let's look at a case in which something like this become relevant. This is a patient that uh, come, uh, uh, comes in for, a, uh, for a, um, like acute onset of uh, altered mental status and uh, a CT is done and there is this uh, hemorrhage in the, in the floor, uh, uh, in the anterior cranial fossa. And um, as, see, uh, as you see, like, uh, uh, like seizure were suspected at a certain point, uh, like they, or maybe the patient also had seizure, you see the EEG lead and then a CTA is done. And now we see like these uh, uh, vascular structures here in the region of the ethmoid, like feeling also like this, like sort of like pseudoaneurysmal here. This is a classic appearance of, uh, of uh, an ethmoidal dural, uh, uh, cribriform dural arteriovenous fistula. And uh, 
uh, an angiogram is done and um, and you see here on this uh, uh, on this lateral view of a common carotid artery, you see that there is an enlarged ophthalmic artery that goes up and through the ethmoidal artery, like it supplies this fistula, and this is like the venous side of the fistula with some uh, venous aneurysm eventually draining to the superficial sagittal sinus. Um, on the on the later phase, uh, uh, you see like there is venous congestion uh, in, in in the brain. And, uh, and uh, uh, so intervention was uh, planned immediately. And, uh, and uh, uh, you see like here on this, uh, on this, this uh, uh, 3D, uh, uh, just to understand better like the, the anatomy, the location of this, uh, of this fistula, you can see how, uh, let me stop on the right image, yes. So you see how the, the fistula is supplied by this uh, ethmoidal, uh, ethmoidal vessel going medial, and then here you can follow the, the, venous, uh, the venous flow. Um, and here on this uh, on this frontal view, uh, also we can see this enlarged uh, uh, ethmoidal artery going medially and supplying this uh, this fistula. And you see also the continuation uh, in fear of these vessels toward the nasal septum. We'll see that 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 can often pretty commonly. So um, um, these are uh, just the summarized images of 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 the of the supply. Uh, what is interesting about this dual AV fistula is that usually cruciform fistula tend to have supply from both sides and from the uh, external external carotid artery branches. In this case, there was almost essentially unique supply from the from the ophthalmic artery. And uh, uh, again, just uh, uh, represent this uh, a, a good uh, a good view of. Uh, of the same uh, of the same uh, uh, anatomy. Let me stop on some uh, good image. Um, but essentially, like uh, this is what was uh, particularly different than most of the cribriform fistula that we encountered before, is that there was supply only from the ophthalmic artery. And again, like here is the other side, as you see, no supply from the other side or minimal, if any, like and it, from the external carotid artery, just maybe a little blush, but nothing nothing too relevant. So. Uh, how to treat this fistula, it becomes uh, uh, two options. Surgic, surgery is certainly all, always an option or a catheterized through the ophthalmic artery. And here is where it, it becomes important to understand and recognize where the uh, arteries to the, to the globe come from. And again, they will come uh, somewhere around like this third. So as long as we, we uh, embolize and we give ourselves like a, a margin of safety, for example, around here, we should be good in terms of, uh, of uh, um, a complication related to the eye, and uh, this is the um, this is the um, the technical part of it. Uh, Max did the case; I assisted him, and you see, like he used a magic um, a magic uh, uh, catheter uh, with uh, just the, the the wire giving some support, but not really like to, trying to advance the wire in order again like to be safer in terms of like uh, uh, the stomach artery, uh, especially proximal. And you see like that how the catheter went very very smoothly and it got to a wedge position, and there was really no inflow from any other vessels. So that's why the decision at that point was made to use MBCA rather than Onyx because uh, um, uh, because uh, it would we felt like MBCA would have like uh, go through the venous side without much reflux and indeed it was this the injection of MBCA you see the tip of the catheter and you see how uh, like the glue is permeating to the venous side it's going also to the to the septal uh, artery like uh, but uh, no no proximal reflux the patient woke up uh, uh, um, without any any uh, eye issue so this is an example of uh, using like your your knowledge about like uh, you know where 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 really like uh, the arteries to the eye come from in order to 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 like plan your intervention, uh, which again like uh, should be as safe as possible. But in this case, in, the important, in this case, obviously the important thing is to prevent an, an injury to the eye. Now. Um, um, there was a, there has been a, uh, moving back to the anatomy uh, of the of the of these vessels in terms of, in relation to the to the to the optic nerve. There has been a lot of work from Hyre about like recognizing where the different arteries come from. In uh, when we have the different sort of like variants. So these are the supraorbital cores, the infraorbital cores, and uh, it's been like really phenomenal work. Uh, uh, and uh, and even like the interesting thing is that it was without angiography. Now with angiography, you can see also these things. So we may probably. We're in a setting where we can advance that that work probably. What he noted, and what, that's what like we always say about everything, is that the variation is so marked that it is wrong to look for the so-called normal pattern. That's essentially what we always talk about about any sort of vasculature in the brain. Uh, uh, like you know, there, there there's 
we talk about spectrums all the time, right? There's, there's no normal, like it's, it's a spectrum. And so what, uh, what he noticed, for example, is that the origin of the, 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 origin of the central uh, uh, retinal artery, where it come from compared to the nerve and so forth. Very interesting to read, but uh, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll move forward here. This is an example that he, he showed uh, in which like there was like a preserval of the ring like uh, around the optic nerve. So you see like there were preserval of both, uh, both supra and infraorbital branches. So sometimes you can have this sort of like uh, a loop around, around the nerve and show, as showed well in this uh, stereo, uh, stereo pair. Um, uh, then we have the last segment of the ophthalmic artery, which is, uh, uh, runs uh, um, in between the, the medial rectus and the superior oblique. And here you see, can see well on this, uh, on this Dyna CT image, and uh, here in between this, the, medial, the medial rectus and the superior oblique, you see the course of the ophthalmic artery. Something that uh, I like to mention, especially because we have trainees online, is, uh, is uh, like differentiating the ophthalmic artery from the orbital frontal branch sometimes may not be as obvious as it, as it, uh, as it should. And for example, when you look at this, uh, this uh, view, like you see two vessels here, you see one vessel and two vessels here, it's obvious to see that one originates from here. So it becomes obvious to say that this is the ophthalmic artery, but sometimes it's not that obvious. So we have to keep in mind that, uh, that uh, uh, there is uh, another branch comes from the ACA that runs along the roof of the, uh, uh, the, the roof of the lamina cribrosa at the splanus phenoidale, essentially. And this course is essentially on the lateral view, it courses almost parallel to the ophthalmic artery. Uh, how is that? How is that possible? The reason is that we have to think of like uh, 3D and we know that in a sagittal view, this is gonna be the, the, the floor of the orbital of the anterior cranial fossa. While more on a parasagittal region, this is the same, the same view, it was not the move. So like, uh, it's a, it's a, um, these are sequential images. And you see how the orbital roof is actually much higher than, than, uh, than, the, uh, than the level of the ethmoid. And here you can, if doing a MIP, you can put two, two, together the lines and you see how the orbit is much, much higher. And so when we look at an angiogram, we have to think it this way. So, so uh, 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 something that you understand even more if you, under, if you look at, the, if you, at your coronal view. Right, so you have the roof of the orbit here, and the roof of, and the ethmoidal uh, splanum sphenoidal around here. So when we put together like uh, our two vessels, the ophthalmic artery and the, and the uh, orbital frontal branch of the ACA, you see that they project essentially in the same line on a lateral view. So this is an important topic. Is, is an important point is it becomes like um, important for fellows to not be embarrassed when asked about the ophthalmic artery and pointing to the wrong vessel. So. Moving forward about uh, uh, in terms of like uh, branches to the eye and uh, talking more about the branches to the globe itself. Things that we don't pay too much attention as more interventionists, we just say, okay, that's a safety zone and that's it. So it becomes interesting actually to go a little uh, more in detail about this. We, we recognize two different, two big uh, uh, vessels, two big so, uh, kind of vessels, ciliary vessels and retinal vessels. Ciliary vessels are the one that supplies the, the uh, the, the choroid and the sclera uh, uh, of uh, most of the eye. They also supply part of the retina, as I will explain later. Um, in terms of ciliary arteries, we recognize the posterior ciliary arteries, which can be, are the short and, the, uh, and can be medial and lateral posterior ciliary arteries. And here are, are the representation of that. They're around 16 to 20. They arrive close to the nerve, where the nerve, uh, where, uh, close to the papilla, and they perforate uh, and gets to the, to the choroid. And um, these are uh, named short because uh, they originate from the ophthalmic artery and they terminate in the, they're shorter because they terminate here at the proximal, at the most posterior aspect of the globe. And the reason why they're called short is because there are the long one also, the long one that are posterior ciliary arteries that uh, are long because they get into the sclera here, they go through the choroid and then continue without giving too many branches, they continue up and they, they go here to the anterior part of the, of the globe. And that's where they also connect with the other arteries, which are the anterior ciliary arteries that comes from, or anterior usually from the branch that goes to the, to the muscle, they go medial and they supply again the choroid more anterior and they give a branch to the, to the iris. These are to be differentiated from the retinal artery. The retinal artery, which is usually one of the first branch of the, of the ophthalmic artery and then uh, goes anteriorly along the nerve and then it perforates, goes inside through the nerve and then becomes, uh, it goes into the center of the nerve and gets out through the papilla, giving the branches that are very well visible with an eye examination. Um, 
it's, uh, it's very interesting actually to go into the detail about like the microvascular anatomy at the level of the papilla. And there's a lot, a lot of complexity, a lot of like uh, a, a very, um, very detailed work that has been done to evaluate this region. All sort of like, this is the nerve, this is the globe. You see the, the retinal arteries here. You see like all this connection between the, the ciliary arteries and the, and the uh, retinal artery giving all sort of like a zone. There's a lot of study about the watershed zones here things that are not too relevant for the neurointerventionist, but it's good to know that they, they exist. Here you see like the relationship in this, uh, in this histological uh, uh, drawing, the relationship between the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein, that they run one by each other, and we will see some radiological evidence of that. And this is just a, a, a microscopic uh, a view of the retinal artery and the retinal vein perforating, going through the optic nerve to become, to go into the center of the nerve. Uh, this is a beautiful image from Moret uh, uh, with, from his study with La Jonia, and this is a cada cadaveric a specimen view and um, uh, injected, uh, injected obviously. And uh, what is interesting on this image to, to appreciate is, uh, um, first of all, this is the central retinal artery and you see like it, it, it originates here and then it has a, a very tortuous course and then here it becomes, uh, it goes to the middle of the nerve. What you see all the other vessel, all the other uh, uh, ciliary vessel that goes all the way to here. And then you recognize, for example, this is the long posterior ciliary artery. You see how it goes here and then it goes all the way up to the, up to the anterior part of the, of the, of the globe. And uh, um, another interesting thing is recognize how their tortoise here, why is probably like to give slack to the moving eye. We have to think the, of the eye moving in all sorts of direction. That's why we need slack for these vessels. Um, so in, uh, um, um, in terms of like the choroid, the, the choroid, the, the supply to the choroid, we mentioned like obviously the ciliary arteries are the ones that supply. They, they, they give a lot of blood. They, the, the amount of, uh, of blood uh, to, the, to the choroid is, uh, is uh, uh, exceptional. And, um, and uh, most of the blood is located in what is called the choriocapillaries, which is this, uh, uh, this sort of uh, um, layer of the choroid, which is essentially just made of, of vessels, of blood vessels. And uh, um, the area where there's less blood vessel is actually the fovea. Here is an example in a, in a macaco presus. And the reason is that there has to be like a less uh, obscured view for, for the evaluation of the, of the visual field. So that's why here there's, uh, there's less, uh, there's less uh, uh, superficial capillary in this region. Um, the, um, the choreocapillary, uh, uh, choreocapillary uh, um, layer terminates in the region of the equator of the eye. And that's the reason why when we look at the choroid blush on our image, we see like it terminating around here because, because that's, where, that's what gives most of the choroid blush that we see. The blood, the blood in the choreocapillary uh, layer of the of the of the uh, of the choroid, and so we can think of the globe like this, and the equator is around there. So that's why we see the image of the of the blush just up to there. Um, again, some uh, some uh, um, notions about uh, ciliary arteries. They give eighty five percent of the total total ocular blood flow, and. Uh, the choroid, also the choroid vessels supply also part of the retina. So let's keep in mind, 20% of the blood to the retina comes from the central retinal artery and 80% comes from the choroid. So uh, the retina is supplied by both uh, systems. Um, they have variants as well, as much as we do. Uh, sometimes there's a ciliar artery, which supplies also the retina itself, like inside. And this is called like a ciliar retinal artery. I don't, I'm not aware of uh, any uh, radiological um, evidence of this, but uh, you know now I'm, I'm not surprised that with the DynaCT we can one day like uh, um, identif identify one. So moving to the central retinal artery, which is uh, uh, like what uh, uh, like most important of these vessels, obviously uh, we can see here a beautiful uh, um, image from uh, uh, DynaCT in which we actually recognize this vessel. And we see here, we see following here, we see the part that enters to the nerve and we see goes to the papilla and we see probably here posteriorly like, like the vein. So um, uh, the, um, it enters the globe, it enters, sorry, the nerve around 10 millimeter uh, past the, the papilla. And you can, like in this case, it was seven millimeter. You recognize, if you look at this vessel on your DynaCT, you will recognize this. It's visible because its lumen is uh, 0 0.2 millimeter and which is our, actually our um, DynaCT resolution. So it's actually interesting to try to identify your central retinal artery in your angiogram. And, uh, you know, these are just any angiogram that they open and, and you see like, you certainly see like the choroid blush, 
uh, which you will see a little better uh, later in the in the uh, in the angiography uh, um, in sort of like the venous phase of the brain you're gonna see better and then like in the middle you should recognize like sort of like a straight vessel going toward the papilla and that's that's what probably is your right central retinal artery Sometimes it's hard, to, it's hard to identify, like in this case, it's, it's hard to identify the central retinal artery straight. So uh, um, uh, what you can do, though, is like to do a Dyna CT. So you do a Dyna CT, this is a, a thick, dyna, a thick uh, NPR of the of, uh, uh, thick MIP of your Dyna CT. You, you obviously cannot see the, the central retinal artery here. But then when going to the thin cuts, now you, you, you recognize it. And there it is. You see like this specific like uh, sort of turn where it gets to the nerve and gets to the papilla. And now what is, uh, what is good to do at this point, like uh, use your Dyna CT, so you know, you know how the central retinal artery is, open your, your 2D image and try to identify that vessel. Like, is it possible to identify now? Now that we know where and how it is, is it possible to identify? So this is a magnified view, again, like that. And this is a magnified view of, of the angiogram. And now you see like how this vessel indeed, we recognize it. It's not that, uh, that obvious, but now we recognize it's here. It's this one here. And uh, so this is a way to recognize your, your central retinal artery on the 2D going back and forth with your Dyna CT. Uh, this is just another example. Uh, again, like very hard to recognize it here, but uh, you do the Dyna CT and you, now you recognize, you understand why it's hard to see because the nerve here, it takes a turn. So the nurse takes a turn. So it's almost like in a position that we don't expect the central retinal artery is because it becomes oblique. And we know the nerve can be tortuous. So just be, be ready to identify this sort of like more oblique way to, for the, to find the uh, retinal artery. Um, and um, this, is, uh, um, this is just the, uh, the, same, uh, um, the same patient in which, uh, in which uh, we can see like here on this uh, coronal view, we see like the, the artery going into the middle of the nerve and then, uh, and then giving uh, continuing uh, straight uh, along the nerve. This is like, a, um, uh, there it is, like a sagittal view of the same thing. Um, yeah, so these are the, the representation of it perforating through the nerve and this is like in the middle of the nerve. So, why is this important to recognize this vessel? Because sometimes you may have complications that show mine at 85 year old um, uh, with uh, AFib uh, aphasia, right side weakness, NIH stroke scale of 24, uh, comes in with this CT, um, essentially normal. Um, uh, CTA shows two things. It shows like an occlusion of the, of the MCA bifurcation and it shows a pseudo occlusion of the, of the proximal ICA uh, of the cervical ICA with a plaque in the in the um, in the neck, and uh, this is the perfusion showing a large territory of penumbra. Obviously, this is a go. We start from the other side to try to understand more, like the occlusion and uh, and uh, um, we sh again some collaterals, but it confirms the MC occlusion. Here is the is the um, is the neck, which shows like this plaque. We managed to go through uh, actually like. Uh, uh, like with still the occlusion, we look at the at the brain and uh, and we see that there is a, a there is a collateral filling of the ophthalmic artery through some uh, collaterals. We recognize the deep temporal artery here uh, through the collateral that goes through the zygoma and then it reconstitutes the ophthalmic artery, but also from the superficial temporal artery to the supraorbital artery going back and supplying supplying the brain. So there is collaterals, and we see that in the late phase of this common, we see the choroid blush. So there is a, we know that the, it's through these collaterals that she's uh, feeling the, uh, uh, the choroid and the, and the eye. We do the, uh, the, the thrombectomy, uh, we go through the neck and then we, we remove this, uh, this uh, clot from the, from the brain. And then uh, we have to pay attention to our, our plaque, very severe, so <clears throat> with a filter in place. We, um, we actually put a stent and you see there is a filter and you recognize that there is a little thing in, in the filter which is, uh, which is a clot, which we actually found when we removed the filter. This is the final, which is beautiful, like a very good looking uh, and, um, and, uh, and delayed scan, it's still open. And this is the final, again, like uh, looks good, everybody's happy, uh, recanalization, patient wakes up, moving everything, get an MRI, very good, like just a little, a little dots, but she's blind on the left eye. 
and the OCT um, reveals thinning of the, of the um, consistent with uh, central retinal artery occlusion. So what happens? So let's go back to the image. First of all, like on the MRI, you, you see that actually this, uh, you see this diffusion restriction along the, along the nerve and in the choroid here, which is suspicious. And then on the MRA that was at the same time, you see the ophthalmic artery on the right, you do not see an ophthalmic artery on the left. So now it becomes a little uh, scary that there indeed we did something. And we, we look back at the images and, uh, and this is how we were at the beginning. And at the beginning, again, we saw like this uh, feeling, uh, retrograde feeling of the ophthalmic artery with the choroid blush and, uh, and probably here the posterior ciliary artery and the central retinal artery. After the recanalization in the neck, now there is antegrade feeling of the ophthalmic artery and that was good. This is what we see after the M1 thrombectomy. So uh, and something that I didn't notice at that time, but uh, now it's obvious there is no antegrade feeling of the ophthalmic artery anymore. And, uh, and this is the final, uh, after carotid artery stenting again, no feeling of the ophthalmic artery. So this is at the beginning. And this is at the end, when the, with a common injection, we see some retrograde feeling. Some retrograde feeling from the, probably again, from the, uh, um, from the supra orbital artery. But this feeling, this retrograde feeling compared to the initial one doesn't get all the way to the ophthalmic artery, but it stops here. And indeed, we don't see the posterior ciliary artery here and probably we don't obviously uh, also the retinal artery which comes around the same location is not feeling so that's why the patient the patient was uh, was blind because you, we can think that indeed like there was a, a clot probably exactly in that region if the clot was much more proximal we would have had the retrograde feeling if the clot was more distal we would have had the, like uh, antegrade feeling but uh, being the clot exactly in the in, in, in the in the in the in the turn where these vessels, the vessel to the eye come from, became, became like the problem, her problem. Uh, Emboli in new territory in the ophthalmic area during stroke is almost unheard. Um, there's just a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, case reports. Um, so, uh, so this is a very rare, uh, very rare uh, complication uh, that uh, um, I invite everybody to be aware of. Um, so, um, Trying to understand more uh, about the supply to the optic nerve is actually like our, 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 our Dyna CT becomes interesting because when you look at posterior, the posterior part of the nerve, we can see that there are little branches around the nerve, both on your, uh, on your coronal view, we can think of the nerve with uh, the branches around, and on, on your uh, uh, sagittal view, you see like branches that surround the nerve. And these indeed were described, no question, they were described by, again, by Hira, and we, they described that, that these collateral branches to the, to the nerve coming from the ophthalmic artery all the way, actually, not just, uh, not just at, at this level. What is also interesting is, uh, um, is that he also describes, uh, I couldn't find a lot of reports, but described also a branch uh, uh, coming from the ophthalm, proximal ophthalm in, in internal carotid artery and, and, and supplying the optic nerve here. Now, I didn't find any uh, uh, radiological evidence of this, but is it possible that these, uh, uh, these vessels sometimes can be the origin of the dual cave aneurysms? I don't know, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that to understand. Uh, moving forward uh, in terms of like uh, uh, arteries and supply to the, to the orbit, uh, these are drawing from NeuroAngel that shows all these branches and uh, I'll move kind of quickly about this. Um, uh, obviously we have a lacrimal artery. In this case, we, this, uh, this, was, uh, this is represented by going through a meningo lacrimal, but the concept is that uh, uh, you're gonna see this supply like which is lateral and superior sort of to the orbit and this is the lacrimal gland. And usually this artery also gives supply to, to, to other uh, uh, adjacent, uh, uh, adjacent uh, uh, muscles. And then each, each muscle has, has an artery. And you see here on this view, on this Dynacity, you're gonna see like a vessel in each of the muscles. Each artery, uh, each muscle gets an artery. Ethmoidal vessels, we have see here a, a good, a nice drawing from an Italian group. And, uh, and we see on this, uh, this is a pathological example in a patient with Moya Moya. And you see here both well, very well represented the ethmoidal artery. In this case, it was even sort of like a fluorated aneurysm because this anterior ethmoidal artery was supplying a lot to the, to the, uh, to the brain. So uh, all vessels we can identify. Sometimes the ethmoidal artery then gives up the arteries to the septum. In this case, it's a very good representation of that ophthalmic artery giving the ethmoidal artery, then in turn gives the supply to the uh, nasal septum. Other, you can go like, uh, you can, we can spend days here looking at all the branches, but the, the thing is that on the Dyna CT, you recognize everything. Here are the palpebral arteries, like a very, very good representation of that with the arcade along the superior palpebra. 
given that how complex is this topic, I couldn't spend a lot of time on the concept of uh, dangerous anastomosis because the, the, con the understanding of the dangerous anastomosis becomes almost obvious once you understand the anatomy. And if you understand all the possible connection with the, be, between all the arteries, it's obvious what the, then what is dangerous and what is not. What I'm showing you here, these are stereoscopic images of, uh, of a patient with a, um, um, a proximal uh, carotid occlusion due to a dissection. And this is just a beautiful stereoscopic view, which shows some of this connection. You see a very good retrograde feeling of the, of the, uh, uh, of the of tannic artery that, feels, uh, that retrogradely fills the uh, internal carotid artery. How is it filled? Through essentially a lot of these possible branches that we mentioned. Like for example, here we have the supraorbital artery from the, uh, from the STA. We have the, the uh, deep temporal artery here supplying through the zygomatic branch. And we have uh, uh, sort of like some uh, nasal septal uh, branches uh, helping here as well. Now, the concept is that you know, you know where, you know the connection, you know what is dangerous. Um, so speaking of which, it's, it becomes a very, very uh, useful to show this case of, a, um, of a, what uh, could have been a, a tragic case of a very young patient having a, a left uh, carotid carinus fistula and left eye complete blindness after, after a, a motorcycle accident. And we treated the left side uh, uh, for a carotid cavernous fistula, the left side was, was cured, uh, uh, even though, again, he left vision on the left eye. But during the angiogram, we also identified this uh, uh, finding here on the right side. And, uh, and you see here how is this, this is a pseudoaneurysm uh, coming from the ophthalmic artery. And we see here a better view of it. It's from the ophthalmic artery itself. It's not from the, from the internal carotid artery. You see the ophthalmic artery coming here with this pseudoaneurysm and continuing here. And... Uh, um, so this becomes very critical because the patient is already blind on the left side and now we have to deal with this right side at the pseudoaneurysm. So what to do? Um, you know, there's uh, um, different, uh, different strategies, uh, um, and, but what become here really relevant is like the understanding of the anatomy. So we went to the external carotid artery doing a very good injection of the external carotid artery. And now what you see here is a retrograde feeling of the uh, ophthalmic artery from the external carotid artery injection. Uh, how through mostly like through uh, this uh, um, uh, through a, a branch from the infraorbital artery. Uh, we didn't have a dynasty here, uh, but it, it, essentially what you see is reconstitution of the ophthalmic artery all the way to the internal carotid artery. And you see here the same shape of the vessel uh, from the internal and external injection. So here it becomes uh, uh, with this understanding become obvious that uh, you know we can sacrifice this vessel. And we went inside, we, we coiled it off, and when we finished the, the work also with a pipeline just to, to make sure that we were, uh, uh, that the, this last coil would not have uh, migrated into the vessel, woke up with intact vision. And, uh, and uh, uh, there was, uh, um, I didn't show the final here, I, I missed it, but essentially the final external showed a very good retrograde feeling of the ophthalmic artery as, as you would expect from, from this view. So really like the understanding of the anatomy here becomes, uh, becomes important to also strategize your intervention. Uh, Max, any, uh, can you ask if there's any question because I, before I move forward to the embryology part? Uh, yeah, let's take a little, maybe like a minute or two break. Is there any questions? Um, I showed I show some cases. I'm sure somebody can have some comments or, or, uh, or, uh, um, uh, question about the cases that I showed. Yeah. All right, just unmute yourself, speak up if there's any questions. Obviously there's like a ton of information there. It's an amazing topic and Eitan's like so so comprehensive. But um if you do have questions, um let us know. Okay. Um all right so moving forward I hope uh, everybody's following me here. Um Moving forward to like a topic that I really care a lot, which is the embryology. And, uh, you know, for the embryology of the ophthalmic arteries, that has, there is a lot of literature, like in, almost too much, actually. Um, and so it's good for, for especially for trainees, it's, it's, it's good to have like sort of like something, some common uh, things to remember. Um, so in the literature, there's this talk about the Paget theory versus the Lajonnat theory. It seems like the theory were, are in contrast, while instead they're not in my opinion. What is important to think of is like uh, we have two 
the two main vessels supplying to the orbit, which is, we call it one ventral ophthalmic artery that comes from the anterior cerebral artery. And then a dorsal ophthalmic artery it comes from the ICA more proximally. Now this vessel, moving on, they create some sort of connection one with each other, with, uh, with this turn. And then one, uh, and this is an example in vivo of the, of the uh, presence of both vessels. And then one takes, uh, 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 takes uh, becomes more dominant than the other, and then the other regresses. And this is more or less like what happens. In the equation, we have to add also like a supply from, uh, we can think of this as the stapedial artery, the supply, like essentially the uh, precursor of the middle meningeal artery and the supply with the supraorbital branch. So we have to add that into the equation as, as well. So instead of thinking, uh, 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 Paget versus La Jonia. Essentially, La Jonia theory were, were made like based on, on the angiographic per, uh, view. So indeed, when you, we look at the angiography and the, and the variance from the angiographic perspective, the La Jonia theory makes more sense, but uh, it's not that uh, it's because it's there true or not, it's, uh, it's, but it's good to remember it because it makes sense. The main difference are really like the name the artist goes through the optic foramen. Like if you look at the, all these literature, they discuss how it was the persistent dorsal for Paget, persistent ventral for La Jonia, but they talk about the same vessels. So essentially this is just semantics, so not too important. Um, then uh, another difference is the formation of the proximal ophthalmic artery. So if we think of the proximal ophthalmic artery coming from here, and we all agree about that, how, um, how that, that now becomes and, and goes in fear and comes from here, for Paget, it was sort of like an anastomotic progression is called, meaning there is different differential growth of different things. So, um, uh, uh, so the vessel becomes, uh, goes and, and changes, the, changes uh, uh, position because of that. For La Jonia, it was an intradural anastomosis. So the vessel comes here and then it, it, uh, and then it forms a new anastomosis with the artery artery here. I have to say, I, I kind of favor the anastomotic progression. It kind of makes more sense. But, you know, again, like this is it's just a subtlety in the difference. And then another difference is, the, is how to put together the ILT, the infralateral transformation. And again, this goes into extreme level of complexity to understand. Some people talk about the persistent maxillary artery versus persistent dorsal stomach artery beyond our scope here. What is our scope instead is uh, to understand the convergence between the theories and understand the, the, our variance because of this embryology. So something that we all agree on, there's two arteries. One ocular artery that goes through the optic foramen and gives the, gives the central retinal artery and the choroidal arteries, okay? And it gives to the globe. So one ocular artery, and then we have one orbital artery that goes through the superior orbital fissure, and then it supplies all the rest of the orbit, so the muscles, the glands, etc. Okay, so these arteries, though, have potential connection, and the potential connection between these arteries will result in, in all the many variants that we are uh, we're going to show. This is an example in vivo uh, in in a radiological specimen of like uh, uh, these two uh, the persistence of ocular artery coming from here. Small, it's small because supplies only the globe versus the orbital artery coming here from the middle meningeal and supplying all the rest of the orbit. So the ocular artery and the orbital artery is something that it seems we all agree upon. So let's try to understand, uh, let's try to apply this to our variants. So understand embryology to understand the variants. First, like uh, how, how this uh, concept of like the progressive uh, descending uh, of, the, of the anterior, uh, sorry, uh, the, the persistent uh, ophthalmic artery applies in variants. And we see how it applies because this, uh, depending on where this stops, we can have an origin more proximal or more distal. For example, in this case, you see that the origin is a little more, more distal than what we're, we're used to. Why? Because if we think it this way, essentially like this descending was not completed all the way. So that's why we see such a variant. Or these other two cases from uh, Lydia Gregg, uh, in which she shows here like an origin at the level of the posterior communicating artery. Okay, fine, again, it makes sense or here at the level even higher up, almost like at the terminus of the carotid again. This makes sense because we know how this happens, right? Now, um, um, this is also another, another example of ours coming from a very distal ophthalmic artery. Um, now, this, uh, um, this, this can also turn like, in a, like even more proximal, it, it, the vessel can come directly from the anterior cerebral artery. These are persistent of the embryological status in which the ophthalmic artery is supplied by a vessel coming from there. 
And you see this in a patient with an aneurysm, you see this uh, uh, stereo pair, which shows this very well coming from the A1. So this makes sense embryologically. Now, another facet of the same issue is, uh, is uh, uh, when you think of the infraoptic course of the ACA. So, um, so here you have this uh, uh, MRI showing this, uh, this vessel coursing like in, a, in a, an unusual way. Uh, you see the vessel, the vessel here. And, uh, and when you do the uh, uh, CTA, you see a vessel essentially is the, an ACA coming very proximally, coming very proximally. And, and you see with a, with a course, which is actually like a different course than usual. Why is that? How to understand this? Again, we understand it from the same way. So if we think of the, of the uh, ventral dorsal artery coming down, okay, uh, uh, we, we can think of a certain point where we have this appearance. And uh, this is following actually La Jonia sort of like a theory. We have this appearance of the ventral dorsal, uh, dorsal uh, uh, ventral ophthalmic artery coming down and then supplying the eye. Okay, so there is this anastomosis at this level between these, uh, the ventral ophthalmic artery and the ICA. So what happens if uh, for some reason this uh, segment of the ACA regresses and doesn't develop well, what happens is now the flow to the anterior cerebral artery will use this other route. Okay, so this is essentially the same concept looking at it from the other side. This is an example in a patient with Moya Moya, in which what we see like is the, is the feeling of the, of the uh, anterior cerebral artery through this ventral ophthalmic artery going up and feeling it retrograde. Again, the same concept, it's just a different perspective. Now, this is another variant, uh, um, like unique case in the literature from uh, a group from Bendorf, uh, Copenhagen, and you see how the the ophthalmic artery here is supplied by, by the, uh, uh, by the, essentially by the posterior communicating artery. But again, like in a patient with anagenesis of the ICA, which was this patient had, like is it just makes sense. It's just, this uh, we, you can think of this as the distal ICA. Again, same variant of the same uh, concept. So. Moving forward to the other, in, uh, other embryological variant, I want to introduce this drawing, which I will use in the next few slides. So here you have, uh, we're looking, we can think of looking at the right eye on an axial perspective, okay? So we have the right intracarotid artery giving off the ophthalmic artery here, okay? And this is the optic foramen, this is the optic nerve, obviously. And then we have uh, uh, the, um, uh, the infralateral trunk, we have the meningohypophyseal trunk, which is connected potentially with the, uh, with the infralateral trunk as we know, and both are potentially connected with the middle meningeal artery that comes from below and goes through the uh, 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 foramen spinosum. The middle meningeal artery has potential connection through the superior orbital fissure, okay, and through the uh, 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 foramen of hurtle, through the uh, uh, lateral foramen, through the, uh, uh, the uh, orbit. The meningohypophyseal trunk, as we know, is connected also potentially posteriorly to the tra trigeminal artery to the basal artery. So this is the drawing based on upon which I will show you like the um, all the variants, starting from the most usual pattern, which again is like the ophthalmic artery coming from here and supplying all the all the orbit on top of the retinal artery. This is the most usual pattern. Now, what happens in, if instead like the ophthalmic artery is supplied from here? Like we know there is a potential route. So here, if this takes over, uh, like this is gonna be the supply. And this is what we call it, the deep recurrent of Tony Carter. Some people call it inferolateral trunk origin. Again, this is all semantics. You have to understand it. Semantics is secondary. But uh, uh, what we know is that this always goes through the superior orbital fissure. That's what we know. Okay, there's no dorsal, of, uh, uh, there, there's no origin of the ophthalmic artery from here that then goes through the, uh, through the optic foramen. Uh, this is an example from our images. We see the persistent dorsal ophthalmic artery going anteriorly and supplying the, the orbit. Multiple uh, examples. In this case, also, we have persistence of the ophthalmic artery proper to the optic foramen, as well as uh, this, uh, uh, this dorsal ophthalmic artery. And uh, this is uh, another example. This is a good uh, stereo pair in which you can see. And uh, most of the time there is persistence also of the ophthalmic artery proper, but uh, often, sometimes that, that is not the case. Um, this is an, an interesting case because uh, it's a, uh, you see like uh, persistence of both in this patient with an aneurysm that uh, undergoes uh, treatment with pipeline. And uh, you see how the dorsal of thumb supplies mostly the orbit, which is like the orbital artery compared to the ocular artery proper coming from here. But we know they have anastomosis, right? So you treat it with a pipeline, right? The aneurysm regresses, but also like the, now the ophthalmic artery ventral is, 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 uh, partially covered, so what happens, the dorsal ophthalmic artery becomes dominant, 
all right? And here you see retrogradely filling uh, what used to be like the, uh, the ocular artery proper and here filling the, the eye with obviously no complication, not obvious, but essentially no complication, essentially like a rearrangement of the vessel, uh, of the vessel around the, uh, the device. So another example, what happens if the uh, ophthalmic artery is supplied by the middle meningeal artery? Is that possible? Yes, based on our drawing, that's possible, right? That's a possible connection that we, we see pretty often, actually. It's what we call the meningophthalmic artery. We do like an intracardial artery injection. We don't see the ophthalmic artery. We actually see the orbital frontal artery. So again, fellow, don't mistake this for the ophthalmic artery. Okay, and then we look at the external carotid artery, and now we see the supply to the, to the eye. How? To the branches to the superior orbital fissure. And here you see it also on an MRA. You see a normal one on the left side, and now on the right side, you see this branch coming from the middle meningeal going back and supplying the eye. Um, so this connection becomes uh, uh, very important for, uh, for understanding of, uh, of uh, vasculature uh, uh, for, for in, in certain diseases. And, uh, and here you recognize that there is a, this patient has like a abnormal, abnormal vasculature here in the roof of the orbit. And uh, you see like an, an enlarged Rosenthal vein with a sort of like a pseudo aneurysm there as well, a venous aneurysm. And this is a dural arteriovenous fistula. And, uh, um, and here you see like uh, on T2, you see like these uh, engorged veins and, uh, and on T1 post contrast, you can see how uh, again, like uh, uh, we think, we can think of this as, a, as an orbit roof, uh, dural arterial venous fistula. Uh, these are the angiographic images from that. And, uh, and uh, you can see how um, indeed uh, um, there is supply from both the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. Why? Because we know this connection between the meningeal arteries, uh, middle meningeal artery and the, and the meningeal artery and, and the, and the uh, ophthalmic artery itself. So uh, this is a, a selective view of the internal carotid artery showing the supply to this uh, fistula here, also probably from this uh, um, infralateral trunk. And then here you see the supply from the external carotid artery to the fistula. So uh, in, in this case, we actually prefer to go again from the, from the orbit, from the ophthalmic artery itself. Oh, this is a Dyna CT showing better like the point of the fistula, which is actually not at Moida, it's, it's much more posterior than that. And, uh, and here is the fistula, uh, beautiful images. And uh, we went with a scepter seat through the, through the orbit uh, and, uh, and we inflated and here is the injection through it. And then we decided to treat this with uh, actually with onyx. Again, being very careful not to have reflux uh, up, to, up to such a region here. And this is the final showing a complete cure. So this allocation in which we have exactly like that sort of connection between the meningeal, uh, uh, me between the middle meningeal artery and the ophthalmic artery. And this is the final showing the, uh, the location of the, of the onyx. I move forward to this case. We can maybe show it back uh, later. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, moving forward to the, with an logical variant, now we understand how if, 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 the, if the supply goes, uh, instead of going through here, it goes through here, it's the same concept. You know, it's still meningeal meningeal artery supplying it, what we call it meningolacrimal. Meningolacrimal, which is very vis well visible on your frontal view, you're gonna see this sort of vessel going up like this and you're gonna, recognize your foramen of fertile much better in this other case with the Dyna CT you see the vessel going here and then it can supply only the lacrimal artery or sometimes it can think it can take oh, can take over the whole orbit okay so be mindful about that um, now um, the same concept can also be applied retrogradely. So sometimes instead of the middle meningeal artery supplying the orbit what can have you can have an ophthalmic supplying the middle meningeal artery what we call it a recurrent meningeal or what, how I like to call it an ophthalmo meningeal to give a sense of like the direction of the flow. Okay, and here is, a, is an example. If you have an ophthalmic artery supplying this middle meningeal artery here or this other example uh, in which uh, uh, we have like, we see on this patient with an ADM, we recognize that there are these straight vessels in the same ICA injection. And uh, on this uh, later phase, we see these straight vessels here, which feels a little later than uh, the usual cerebral vessels. These are the, the, the meningeal vessels. There's a very small, if any, middle meningeal artery coming from the external. Okay, why? Because the, the middle meningeal artery comes directly from the ophthalmic artery, and you, you actually recognize it also on your, on, your, on your MRA. This is another example. We see these things on a cross-sectional imaging. And uh, this is a courtesy of uh, Matt Young. You see this, uh, this vessel here from the from the, from the ophthalmic artery going back and supplying the middle meningeal artery. So same concept, it's just 
the same the other direction. Okay, now moving a step forward, cases which are very, very rare in the literature is that if we think of this network, like there is a potential for the vessel to come directly from the buzzer, right? There is a buzzer, there's a trigeminal artery and the, to the MHT and then filling this, this trunk all the way to the orbit. Yes, there is a potential from, if we understand the embryology, there is a potential. And this is an example from the literature in which the ophthalmic artery comes directly from the buzzer artery. And this is a more beautiful uh, uh, picture from uh, Paul Bogal in which he shows the same thing, which is much better uh, represented with the Dyna CT, but the same concept. You see like there is an ophthalmic artery coming directly from the buzzer artery. It's something that if you understand the anatomy and the embryology, we understand how this can happen. Middle meningeal artery coming from the buzzer, not really like an ophthalmic thing, but if we understand that, like again, like it it's just makes sense. It's just like another member of the same family, I call it, right? Middle meningeal artery coming from the, coming from the buzzer artery. If we understand this connection, we understand these variants. Um, terminating the variance with this uh, uh, something which is very interesting actually. I, I see Jacques Dion is online. He, sh he showed uh, such a case a few years ago on JNIS. And, um, and uh, uh, if we think of, uh, of, of this connection, we can see how potentially like there's also a retrograde connection all the way like that, right? And um, this is something that would happen should this segment of the ICA regress or not develop well or have an injury, okay? The ICA potentially can, re, re, can flow like a back, like using this connection. And uh, uh, they showed this, uh, this case, which they call it anomalous course of the ophthalmic artery in the orbit. Okay, so we can think of the normal carotid being like this, and now it's much, much longer. And now we have, re, re, interestingly, uh, recently a case, thanks, thanks uh, Anna and Omer, uh, to show it to me. We have a normal carotid on the right side. And then on the left side, we see this uh, very anomalous course of the carotid, right? And uh, if we look at the MRA on, the, on a cross-sectional, on, on an axial view, we recognize this is the case. And we can see indeed that there is a part that goes through the superior orbital fissure and another one that goes through the optic foramen. So what happens here? What happens is that uh, we have to go back to La Jonia and the concept of segments. If segment six in between the dorsal of tummy artery and the, and the ventral of tummy artery and the dorsal of tummy artery doesn't develop or regresses or has a problem or is vulnerable for any reason, that is how the, the carotid can feel back. And these are drawing representing the same thing. If we have a vulnerability of a problem with this segment, what happens is that there is a potential connection between the dorsal of tummy artery and the ventral of tummy artery, and now the flow to the carotid goes along this direction. And that is what we see in this particular case. Um, another uh, five minutes, um, orbital veins. Again, I want to recognize the incredible work of uh, Jacqueline Vignot for these veins. Like, I mean, again, the main motive was to understand the, the mass. And here you have different example of masses. She's looking at the, at the eye. So this is a frontal view, this is a lateral view, and this is an axial view. And uh, this is a normal patient. These are all patients with different masses in different places. So to understand where the masses are, she would have looked at the, at the uh, uh, compression on, the, on those. Uh, Obviously, it's a very highly variable uh, uh, um, anatomy. Uh, we can think of the superior ophthalmic vein as the confluence between the supraorbital and the angular at the trochlea and then the continuation. Um, and this is just, uh, just to understand our anatomy in some, in some patient, we have like the angular and the supraorbital uh, and confluent here into the, uh, into the uh, superior ophthalmic vein that then gives the, this sort of angle. And this is uh, uh, the, the, same, uh, um, the same anatomy, but in a, in, a, in a pathologic patient with a carotid cavernous fistula. And you see, but the anatomy is very, is very regular, actually. That anatomy of the superior orbital vein is, is uh, superior ophthalmic vein is very uh, consistent. And uh, another, um, this is uh, just again like ophthalmic vein, superior and inferior ophthalmic vein is a very good representation on, on this uh, angiographic view. Um, um, I, this is a, a, an example of how to apply this in a patient with a fistula, and uh, we have to keep in mind uh, uh, we have to keep in mind the direct approach to this kind of fistulas. And in this patient with a carotid cavernous fistula, we understand the the, um, the venous uh, outflow by looking actually from the other side, and uh, we ended up doing a, a direct puncture. But uh, uh, so first, we have to understand like uh, uh, this is like the confluence of these veins, and you have to reach there. So how to reach there, uh, how to reach to this point 
from, uh, uh, from a direct approach. You have to essentially stay with your needle in fear and, and lateral and pointing to the superior orbital, uh, uh, to the superior orbital fissure. You see here the optic foramen, we stay away from that and we point uh, like to the, uh, to the superior orbital fissure. And then at a certain point we get, we get uh, blood flow return and, uh, and we are, uh, it means we are at the fistula and, uh, and uh, so we can then apply our, do our intervention, which becomes straightforward in terms of what to do. Um, but uh, uh, the important thing is like, to understand and keep that as uh, one of the variants of, uh, in our, our work. Um, this is also another, another example of another so possible, uh, possible approach of, uh, of uh, if we understand the vein, we can understand this other approach. In this case, this was first in another institution. It was treated, this uh, uh, indirect uh, cavernous fistula was treated using onyx through the uh, accessory um, meningeal artery. Uh, not successful, comes back to us. And here on the angiogram, we see like uh, this because we did a cut down and we went to the ophthalmic artery and now uh, through a uh, superior ophthalmic vein, sorry, and now we can just close this fistula, relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, so just keep that also as an option in case there's no uh, good way to get uh, with your direct puncture. Here uh, we see like this sort of like venous congestion along the, uh, the lateral uh, rectus muscle and the superior rectus muscle, very uh, beautiful image actually. And this is the final. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, um, uh, last thing uh, I wanted to mention is something that we very cool that we can see now on our Dyna CT is the vorticose veins. When you look at the vorticose veins, uh, uh, on uh, it as there's a lot of uh, pathologic literature, but really like not uh, much uh, radiological pictures of it. And now we see on our Dyna CT we see these vorticose veins, which are essentially the vein of the choroid. Okay, and they have this sort of like arch-like appearance. And they, there's one per quadrant, so there's four vorticose veins. But how they 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 are visible? They're very well visible on your Dyna CT. You just have to play uh, uh, play around your Dyna CT. Uh, you do sort of like a thick MIP, and then you rotate. You rotate it around, and uh, and now you recognize this vein, sort of arch-like. And here you see like the papilla at the center, and something very very cool. I don't see like an obvious angiographic uh, um, uh, NURAYAR uh, uh, um, use of this, but it's uh, certainly uh, beautiful to look at. Um, central retinal vein, we mentioned it before, it runs together with the central retinal artery for a period, but it usually tends to go more posterior. So here you see the central retinal artery, and here now you see the central retinal vein, something that we see on our angiogram. And uh, now we can think of, of it, most of the time it drains to the superior ophthalmic vein. So here we can see that probably is it this one? Is that why a patient, this patient had a problem in the vision? Probably, right? If we think of this central retinal vein draining to the uh, superior ophthalmic vein, we understand how this fistula would cause issues in, in the eye. So to conclude, very long talk. Um, this is a quite complex and variegated territory. Um, like again, like uh, um, um, most of the knowledge uh, um, uh, that we have comes from angiographic studies, and uh, and is uh, um, it's actually it's, it's incredible work that has been done. I feel now with the Dyna CT, we have the potential opportunity to actually go a little step forward in understanding radiological anatomy, as I showed you in a, in a few cases. Um, I also suspect that uh, a lot of this uh, understanding may lead potentially to new conquer for the NUR IR world. Because if we think of like getting uh, smaller catheters, smaller wires, if we can maybe like one day go, why not go selected into one of the uh, ciliary arteries, maybe we can st start thinking about uh, doing, uh, taking care of other diseases too. Um, so obviously as always, like the embryology is paramount to understand the variants. And, uh, and, uh, but if you understand the embryology, then you're going to be ready to understand every variant that comes your way. So that's, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you again for having me, Max. Hey, hey Tan, thanks so much. Um, it's an awesome talk, of course, and it's a ton of work. Hey, Tan's worked on it for basically the five weeks since we pushed it back a week. Uh, we're going to be second week now of the month, so there was a little bit more time. But as you can see, it's a uh, tremendous amount of material in there it's gonna it's recorded it's gonna be on the youtube um go back to it of course um but now let's spend some time um any questions comments please either ask in the chat or speak up
if I may say something. Of course. This is, this is Dodi. <laughs> of course, I have to say something because uh, maybe I should. Um, because uh, when I hear and listen about embryology, uh, I always have some unhappy feelings and uh, <clears throat> and I have to to say something. Uh, so I, with absolute great respect for uh, everybody, La Jeunesse and, uh, and all the others who have talked uh, uh, in, in, in the literature and, and, uh, and lessons and lectured us about it, I think um, it, it just explains that anything is possible. We have all kinds of, of, of possibilities and, and, and we say, okay, anything is possible. But so for me, it's easier to explain it in a different way, starting from two, two concepts. The first, vessels are everywhere, arteries are everywhere. And second is the distal territory who commands the development of the vessels. So if, if you don't have a frontal lobe, you will not have frontal arteries. Uh, you cannot have frontal arteries without a frontal lobe. It's the frontal lobe that decides what kind of arteries it will have. So it's, it's, uh, if you start thinking that way, which is centripetally, somebody said that just now, and you come from the distal part to uh, the, the proximal part, and you don't say the, art, the ophthalmic artery exits the carotid artery and enters the eye, but you should say, the ophthalmic artery exits the eye and goes towards the, the internal carotid artery because that's the way it happens. It's, it's the eye that needs blood and will find a way to get blood from the internal carotid artery. And, and which way will it find? The easiest, the, the, the simplest. The easiest way is the, nor, the more frequent one. Sometimes that's not the easiest and it will find another one. Sometimes they, there will be some kind of problems due along that, that way. So we'll find another one, which on anyone, because there are arteries everywhere. And of course there will be an artery up uh, coming from the uh, anterior cerebral artery. There will be one coming from the middle cerebral artery. There will be one coming from the basilar artery because there are arteries everywhere. So that, that's the my point and it explains much easily without having to classify in subgroups in, in uh, the embryo the embryo is just full of vessels everywhere if you look at an embryo and you just consider one of two of them why and all the other ones so i completely want to say it again i respect all the work which is immense on on the embryology which has been done uh, uh, before and now and eight and thank you very much this was incredibly good but it, <laughs> in my heart it, it's it's complicated it's complicated and it, it doesn't need to be that complicated it, it's it's more simple to just think in a in the way that rivers flow down a mountain they will just go down in the in the place where it will be easy to go and if there is a rock, it will turn around and go in a different way. But it, sooner or later, they will be at the end of the mountain. So uh, for me, all of us are embryological variants. <laughs> so sure. you talk about an embryological variant when you say something. Well, all of us are embryological variants. We are, we, we all of us come from an embryo. And during our development, uh, something was decided so that now we are as we are. Uh, and so we are a variant of all the possible thousands, millions, uh, hundreds of millions of possibilities that we, we have. The rearrangement after the pipeline is exactly what happens in the embryo. So the embryo, the pipeline is that thing that happens during the embryological development. Uh, and at certain point, uh, one artery is chosen uh, with respect to the other. Uh, I, I think that's much more easy to to understand from everybody. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I I know I shouldn't have talked, but I, I really think uh, this explains uh, in an easier way. So whenever you see an artery, 
look at where it comes from rather than, uh, I mean, where it goes to rather than when it comes from, because where it goes to is the object that decided how that artery would look like. It's not that it, 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 uh, um, it originates from the internal carotid artery and the internal carotid artery is deciding where that artery is going to be. Is it dorsal or ventral? No, it's the eye which decides if that artery will go to the dorsal or ventral part of the carotid artery. But Dodi, Dodi, this is Ken. Um, the, I, I agree with you that there has to be a demand and you can sort of organize the vascular supply depending on the tissue demand. But what you're implying is that this process is random. And I think, you know, the body of the embryologic literature and the angiographic literature, the anatomic literature, suggests that there are predetermined pathways. And so, yep. yes, there are multiplicity of them, but it's the fact that we can categorize them and classify them in this way, I think argues for some degree of, if you want to call it genetic predeterminism or something in the way that a vasculature develops. Would you agree or disagree with that? <laughs> disagree completely. <laughs> Sorry, because I think that no, it's in our mind we want to classify things, but things that are also not classifiable. Uh, and because it's easier for us to understand and it's easier to communicate to other people what, you know, we give a name to something so that afterwards we can talk about it. But in fact, what happens is completely random. But of course, there are some places where something has to happen, like an artery has to go inside the skull from the heart or, or else the opposite it has to exit from the brain to the heart. And, and so there must be a hole where this artery has to go through. And, and that will, is what happens with the internal carotid artery. And, 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 but once it's inside the skull, the, middle, the branches of the middle cerebral, cerebral artery will just happen anywhere and in some way will gather around to connect to the internal carotid artery. For that reason, there are no two people with the same middle cerebral artery. You can recognize the person by looking at his middle cerebral artery. So it's 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 completely obvious that it's there is no there is not a gene that's saying, okay, now M1, divide yourself after one centimeter, and then M2, after two centimeters, you will divide into two branches. But before that, you will have a perforator. There is no gene that can do that because there would be, we would need hundreds of millions of genes for any specific artery in every specific branch in our body. So it, it's just random. It will happen in the way which is most easy and, and, and uh, uh, fruitful for, for, for the brain. The brain decides, okay, I want blood, I will look for it and I will go in that direction because there, there is a big vessel. What is this big vessel? M1. Perfect. I, I will go there and, and I will take blood from M1. And, and how? Well, it doesn't matter. I will go a little bit upwards and then downwards. Of course, I will follow the, 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 the surface of the brain because, of course, because it's easier rather than, than doing loops and then going around. It's, it just goes straight, like, like a river would go down a mountain. It, the, I will go straight until it's possible. It's not possible. Well, the, I, I, no, that, that's, uh, you know, we, know we, 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 look at the, we look at things in a similar way. And I have to say, like, I, I don't disagree. Like, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a different, uh, it, it, it's not uh, the, the things, they, they don't go one against each other. I mean, uh, the the thing is that uh, you know we, as you mentioned, like we 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 need to talk to each other. We need to make sure that our trainees understand things. We need to write things down. So you know that's where like you know the uh, sort of like it's not really a classification. You know you can give whatever name you want. And I gave you an example where like exactly because of that. I like to call it an ophthalmomeningeal artery, right? It comes from the meningeal artery and goes to, and goes to like it's just like. Sometimes we use uh, we, 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 like we need to use names that we all agree we all agree upon in order to communicate, you know, and also to understand because what you say absolutely makes sense, you know. But uh, 
in order to understand how that happens, you know, like it's, it's good to go a little back because you also recognize in, in your words that there is a one, one sort of like pattern is more common than the other. So uh, why you, you say, because it's easier. Yes, it's easier physiological, physiologically it's easier, but that, uh, that also makes it, uh, uh, makes it uh, 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 ground for, for, for trying to understand things in the other way too. I think what you're saying is useful, but uh, looking at the other perspective also is useful. Well, I think it's actually a profound, you know, philosophical question. Is this a, a re let's just even talk about the middle cerebral artery distribution and how it divides. Is that a randomly generated process or is it actually some thermodynamically driven process that is laid over a genetic basis? You know, like I don't think that there's a random supply of the brain. You know, typically, so frequently you have two carotid arteries and a vertebral basilar system. And there are variants of that, obviously. But to say that it's random suggests that perhaps there could be hundreds of thousands and infinite numbers of pathways to supply the brain. And I think that empirically, you know, the, the, the anatomy suggests that there's an ordered system. I don't know what the ordered system is, but I think it's something to do with an interface between the genetics and the thermodynamics. So yes, supply to a ter the amount of tissue, you know, affects it to a large degree. But I think that it's a very curious question. Like, is this a random process or is it actually, you know, an, an ordered process? We should go on with cases because otherwise people will just leave us and, and stay. <laughs> I, 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 thank you, everybody. Is anybody else? I think we should spend some time on this. It's not, you know, this is important because we, there's just, in part, I think it's important because when people look at embryology, like embryology is a tool, and embryology, I think, obviously, it has a role. and it's not where you're talking about embryology of vessels, but it's not, I mean, Dodi, to your point, like it's not in isolation, right? There's embryology of everything. Like there's obviously a blueprint to our organism within all the uniqueness of us that we have, right? Um, so it's just part of it. And it's not like, obviously we're not completely random. <laughs> we're all human. Um, and so there, there is, you know, there's, there's all that. Uh, but we do have to like stay grounded. Um, if we take embryology to extremes with all these diagrams and all these like ways to try to like, you know, sometimes it gets, not just that it's too complex, it gets, it loses ground and people, I think people lose interest. And we have to, as you mentioned, like you have to, it has to, there's a purpose to it. There's a purpose to understanding of how things work. People have spent lifetimes, you know, see, looking at these patterns and putting it together. Um, and now that we like people like was Johnny and, and so forth, like, when we put together what might seem like strange variants and like weird things that people have classified and maybe not so embryologically um, or physiologically grounded ways, now we can try to put a bigger picture of what is preferred and what is not. So, um, and as long as we stay grounded somewhere in between your view and the whole like the, the completely deterministic view, we're gonna find the balance. And I think we need to keep that balance in mind, otherwise, we're gonna lose our audience. Um, so um, um, let's go back a little bit. Is there any other questions that we have? Any comments about this, the Eitan's talk? Absalmic, anybody want to share? We have some cases to share. Um, uh, I think Vladimir, you're next up uh, for cases, but um, before that, any anything else? Does anyone have any um, anything to add? Okay, Max, Max, can I say something? Uh, Ethan, thank you for the, well, very informative uh, lecture. It, I, I believe it took a lot, a lot of work to, to, to uh, put all these slides and uh, do this lecture. Uh, can I have uh, your comment on, you know, uh, you had a case where, where the patient uh, lost his vi vision uh, after a thrombectomy. Um, and you talked about 
checking out the you know choroid blush uh, for the, um, the you know, patency of the uh, ophthalmic artery. Uh, but do you think if we have the occlusion of only the central retinal artery, would you, would you be able to see to, to still see the choroid blush while losing the vision? Thank would that you. be possible? Thank you Thank you for asking because I meant to say that and I probably forgot. And uh, thank, so thank you for uh, leaving me there. Um, so no, absolutely. As a, as a, you know, by <clears throat> uh, understanding how like the choroid blush that we see on the images is essentially given by everything else but the retinal artery. Yes, the retinal will supply a little part of it, but the 80% of the choroid uh, uh, of the retina also is supplied actually by the choroid. Uh, 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 so the blush that you see on images is actually like uh, uh, not from the central retinal artery. So, um, so the blush, the presence or absence of the blush itself, it, it, it's, it's not like, um, it's just a surrogate. It's, the blush is a surrogate of the, of the supply to the globe. Uh, we do actually uh, uh, have an example of a patient in which the middle meningeal artery was supplying the the, the globe, and uh, uh, we we didn't see a blush at the end, but the vision was preserved. So uh, an example, it was uh, I, I meant to show, but it was just too much. Uh, so so yes, thank you for the question, which is very pertinent and uh, and uh, leads me to explain this other concept. So in that case, though, it's not just the blush that is lost, and uh, um, you know, like I, I I just can show it again because I, I think that's a, that's a, a, an important case for. Uh, uh, for uh, um, for like we all do strokes right and, and for trainees is such a common thing so um, you know when when you look at uh, when you look at here it's not the blush itself that is lost here we lose the whole of tummy artery and uh, like the proximal of tummy artery and the uh, all the ciliary vessel that you should see so and uh, and that's why like we can think of uh, of how like here really like uh, the clot is really at at the level where these uh, choroid uh, vessel come from, and um, so so that's uh, it was not just loss of the choroid here, but loss of this segment also. Okay, thank you, uh, Rafael. I think you have a question. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask if you have some preference or some criteria for the embolization of the anterior uh, dural fistula, uh, anterior fossa dural fistula, uh, when do you prefer to do from the ophthalmic artery or transvenous embolization? For example, uh, due to the risk of uh, loss of vision, when do you prefer to do uh, by the ophthalmic artery or by the venous, transvenous? Thank you, Rafael. That's a very good question. Uh, indeed, I think you have to have to be ready for any 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 uh, any sort of intervention. First of all, don't forget surgery for the ethmoid fistulas is a very good option, right? In terms of uh, uh, endovascular option, you you have a, a, a transarterial or transvenous. When you think of transarterial, I showed a case in which we went through the ophthalmic artery, but potentially there may be also other routes. I have another case, for example, I did recently through the anterior, through the middle meningeal artery. There was the middle meningeal artery going anterior or the way. So keep that in mind too. I mean, look at your angiogram, the whole angiogram, and decide the best, uh, the best route. The transvenous approach, which is something that we did, and is something that uh, can be awesome, but not in all the cases. In the case that I showed you, for example, like the, 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 the transvenous approach was not good because there was a lot of tortuosity in those, uh, in those veins there. So getting through the vein all the way to the foot of the vein would not have been easy. There was no supply from other arteries other than the ophthalmic. So in that particular case, that really was the best. And actually, I would say only endovascular option. Keep in mind, the transvenous approach has potentially some risks. There was recently a, a, a case shown in, a, in JNIS in a technical video in which uh, I think it was uh, uh, Guillermo Dabus uh, and Edgar Samaniego in which they showed uh, uh, they had a, 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 um, a rupture of the vein uh, uh, while trying to catheterize and get to the foot of the vein. Now, rupture of such a vein, which is, has a high flow because of the fistula, can be deadly. And as I think in that case it was. So, 
you know, keep in mind, transvenous doesn't mean safe, okay? But sometimes it's a great option. And there it is, Max is showing the case. Yeah, so that's, I think that's, um, Eitan, that's your case. That's, Thank you very much. And, I mean, so you can see whatever. It's a big vein, right? So like in this case, it's a really big kind of capacious vein. So we had like a little bit of, I don't know, like you're saying, it's not, it's not without risk, but in this case it worked out. So we're like at the foot of this vein and just pack some coils um, in there. And I think we've had, like, I think last time we had a discussion about like, do you need to add any liquid embolic or not? Whatever, we didn't do it here. I think it was just coils. Usually it's very sensitive, like it's very vulnerable on the venous side that you could really just kill it with some coils here. Um, anyway, there's a couple of these like on, on, on the, um, on the um, neuroangio site, on the, um, in the case library. There's a couple of, like we have an example of each kind of treatment for the ethmoid fistula. That's I think the one that you did transarterially like this. That's the hybrid wire, the headway, it's like whatever. It just works great. So that's the anterior meningeal artery. You're coming to the segment. And of course, like uh, Rafael, to your point, yes, like if you have a choice of ophthalmic versus non ophthalmic, you're probably going to choose like a non ophthalmic artery to go through. I think it's safe. Um, okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, um, Vlad, can you share your screen? Uh, so we have a couple of cases. Um, um, Vlad, if you could, let's see if you could start. Let me make sure you, yeah, I think we should share the screen. All right, we can see. Oh, okay, perfect. So um, I had this patient of 65 years uh, who came to me just by ophthalmologist because of these, uh, of his uh, right uh, eye view that was getting all the time uh, bad or at least in the last period was getting worse all day, every day. So he had a very important exophthalmus, he had ptosis, but this ptosis was just like lasting for the last two years. And in the last period, he was uh, noticing uh, that this ptosis was getting uh, worse uh, during the night while he was uh, lying in bed. Uh, he was also presenting the uh, diplopia on the right side and the headache that was getting uh, worse. So they, uh, in the last period, uh, they brought me this uh, uh, MRI that I'm showing you. And uh, I decided to do the angel. And while I done angel, just that evening, patient get even worse. So something like that explains uh, even the situation why he was getting uh, uh, worse his ptosis, why he was lied. Uh, I realized just by the accumulation this time of the contrast media or the getting uh, uh, lower or uh, the flux in the fistula. So these are the injection of uh, common carotid artery from the right side. And I immediately noticed uh, the, um, uh, let's say, uh, flow out in a superior ophthalmic vein and then getting into the ophthalmic uh, in a facial vein of ipsilateral. And then getting also on the other side uh, through the temporal vein and into the jugular external vein. Uh, the, the sinuses and um, let's say normal uh, flow, uh, transversal sigmoid and internal jugular artery from the uh, each lateral side were completely patent. So I went on the other side, injecting, and I'm showing you uh, just the interesting arteries. I'm showing you the internal uh, carotid, injecting the internal, and then from the uh, superior uh, hypophysal artery. Uh, uh, opacification of the, if I understood well, uh, patent part of the cavernous sinus and then uh, toward to us uh, into the uh, superficial, uh, superficial uh, ophthalmic, superior uh, ophthalmic vein and then 
into the fascia, from the other part into the uh, superficial uh, temporal vein. So uh, this is the selective angio, and I'm here just uh, in the external, uh, very close to the maxilla, and uh, uh, studying uh, the distal flow um, of the arteries, which I should uh, choose uh, for the possible embolization. I see um, a lot of different bench branches, and when I've done uh, the uh, 3D angel uh, reconstruction, I realized that I should pass somewhere here to get into the fistula and to embolize the vein. Looking this way was uh, pretty difficult to say, almost impossible, and I made some uh, reconstructions here just to understand um, this is just a, a rotational angel, not a dyna, uh, that I was trying to understand uh, the pathway, where should I pass to reach uh, the fistula and uh, where should I start occlusion of the vein. So in this case, I realized that I had the uh, um, uh, fistula of the cavernous sinus, the second type with the, with the venous outflow just through the superficial ophthalmic vein and distally into the ypsilar facial vein. And the arterial feeders were from the right side, uh, deep temporal artery, mainly the hypophyseal trunk on the right side that I've seen just in a AP view, and the super, superior uh, hypophyseal artery from the left carotid. But this was the, um, let's say, fistula that needed to be occluded. So the discussion was like to do it endovascular and to do it in end surgery, and there was no doubt to, to try it uh, uh, endovascularly, but uh, I was uh, worried about uh, using um, maybe onyx feeder or uh, a glue. And uh, of course, why? Because it was like uh, almost impossible to find the right uh, hypertrophic uh, arteria that was going into the, into the fistula. What to do? Arterial approach or to do the venous approach or maybe to do both? Identifying uh, the uh, artery was in this just like uh, deep temporal. And um, uh, from the vein point of view, which vein to reach, uh, to, do, to choose to reach the, 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 the fistula? If I take a look in the facial vein, it was a uh, good, it was a uh, hypertrophic, but how to reach anterior facial vein? And uh, again, there was a, a tiny part in the angular where it was like passing in the very hypertrophic superior uh, ophthalmic vein. So for me, that way was like uh, less uh, probable to reach. Or maybe I had this uh, idea just to isolate the superior palpebra and then to puncture directly the vein. And then while I was doubting, I asked somebody who had much more experience uh, than me. And uh, he answered, them, mm, maybe you could also recognize uh, the occluded signs. And I was like, okay, how? And then I'm starting taking a look again, the angel. Okay, where should I go? I see here, just uh, starting of the uh, view, uh, venous outflow. I see the superior vein, uh, of tonic vein, but there is no discharge of the inferior pet petrosa signs. So how and should, what should I do here? Where to find the way to reach the cavernous sinus? So I've done the um, arterial approach for the check and then the direct puncture of the neck to do the venous approach. And in the angle, I started to pointing just the um, guide wire. I don't want to say that uh, I was using Chikai Black, but it doesn't mean that uh, you should use some uh, stiff wire, just to use the wire which you're uh, more comfortable to use. So what have I done here? In the moment, I just uh, felt first moment, I didn't uh, save because I was like uh, very 
uh, nervous when I entered inside and I was like confused if I ruptured or I'm in some new space. But then how the wire was moving, I was sure that I'm somewhere inside. So I was following uh, by the SL10 uh, micro guide wire. And here I, I say the old way how the wire was going. So I couldn't go in a direct way, but it started loop. So here I say it is important to use the wire that you know how is acting. This wire I'm using in um, recognition for the stroke. And in the moment I arrived, just where I've seen that the vein was opacifying. So, going in the lateral view, after the angel control, I seen that I was in the right place. This is the injection just from the micro, and I see the uh, superior uh, ophthalmic vein, inferior also, and the, the idea some more detailed uh, study. The idea was starting occlusion from the up by coils, occluding the inferior, and then occluding also the cavernous sinus. And uh, uh, sincerely, this is the navigation of the superior ophthalmic vein, just to get as further as it was possible. Positioning uh, of the coils, just getting back occluding also the inferior part of the inferior uh, of tonic pain, and including also the, um, the part of the cavernous sinus. So this is the check from the uh, arterial injection uh, internal carotid. It looks completely excluded. From the other side, the facial vein and the other vein of tonics are patterned. This is the AP view, and this is the subtracted at the end of the procedure. So this is the check. The patient came seven days after because uh, I gave him a heparin and I wanted to see him a few days after. And this is on the left side is uh, his eye seven days after and one month after he came. So the situation was getting much better. Then three months after uh, he has done the um, angel uh, MRI and it was a period of COVID so he couldn't uh, he didn't come back for the check and now I'm waiting still for him to present and to see the control how it was going uh, in this period but uh, he was getting better with the uh, visus and uh, with the uh, diplopia so this was the case that I wanted to share with you Well, thank you so much. Very nice. Um, it's a topic. It's a good follow-up for Orbit, of course. And uh, also discussed. Uh, we've discussed these approaches extensively um, mm -hmm. um, in, in several sessions. So I think there's a lot of background here. Um, any comments? Any questions? Um, uh, uh, Vlad, this is Eitan. Yeah. Um, that just just as a, I, 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 I'm not sure if I missed the, you show maybe a CT or an MRI showing the inferior petrosal sinus, but um, that's uh, like whenever we, we wonder if there is one or not there, like mm -hmm. we just uh, uh, for our trainees, keep in mind, you can look for the, for the bone, uh, um, for the bone, uh, 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 bone around that area uh, to, to make sure that there is one. Because you know there is a as you know it, some some people just may have a, a, a very small one or an atretic one, and the fact that we don't see doesn't mean that it's it's thrombosed. Mm -hmm. Okay, sincerely, no, I didn't show it, and uh, this patient came uh, from the other hospital, so I had just angio MRI. But uh, the point, that, or let's say that you are pointing, it is really true. So it is good to take a look on. The, on the development of the petrosal sinus. I don't have the CT of this case. Okay, thank you. I would I just add, Vlad, uh, depending on the machine, yeah. of course, we now, you can do it like some sort of dyno or some kind of 3D thing um, for the people that if you're coming in emergently, say someone just comes and they're, you know, coming through the ER, maybe you don't have the images. Uh, uh, but yeah. yeah, I think it's, we, we could talk about it a lot. I think a lot of people, 
um, in terms of transvenous approaches, probably right now, um, the two most commonly used ones are what you had showed um, and the, a direct puncture or some sort of like, some sort of access into the, you know, from into the ophthalmic system. The direct puncture is, I think, gaining some steam um, there as well. Um, but um, it's very obviously, it's really nicely done. Um, any other questions? If not, uh, we move on to Luca. Um, Thanks. But I'll just uh, use this opportunity to uh, wish you a happy holidays because I don't think if will there be some more session huh. before. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You too. And to everyone as well. You're welcome. You come back. It's a pleasure, guys, to spend the time with you and discuss about this uh, fantastic centers. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for showing a case, Vlad. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, we turn. Um, I think yes, Luca. I can we can see you're starting. Okay. Perfect. Good afternoon to everybody. Good 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 morning in the rest of the world. Here is, is the afternoon, it's a, a day or holiday. Uh, I want, the first thing I want to make my congrats to, to Eitan. It was a wonderful, really incredible presentation. Really incredible, very nice. Uh, nice. Don't say everybody that you're a friend of mine, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay I, this is my new place of work. It's Bergamo, maybe you know for uh, COVID in the last winter. And I, and I work in the department of neuroradiology. A case of one, uh, at the beginning of October, a young lady that came uh, with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, 50, 54 years old, and uh, he got just a headache. Uh, we did CT angel, we did MR, we did the first angel, but no, we, we found anything, no, no, no aneurysm, no malformation, no fistula. But I decided to, I proposed to repeat the, the angel and we did a, again a six vessel uh, angiogram. And uh, during the catheterization of the right external artery, this is what I saw with my eye. And I say, oh, this is a fistula, something like this. Okay, I got it. We have to work in the next hours. But at the end of the image, I saw that there is something that it was not usual, not uh, frequent in fistula. I saw the, the brain parenchyma. The, so I turned my, my, my arch and I got, I was in a, on a mount plane uh, and I got the, the same projection. Catheterization, the, I got the catheterization of the ascending pharyngeal artery. But surprisingly, the neuromeningeal branch went to the other side. And I say, woohoo, very interesting now. So I enlarged the, my, my field of view. And again, with the catheter inside the ascending pharyngeal artery, I saw things like this. And I was like the first time with my best girlfriend. Obviously my wife. Now. So, my expression was like this. I never saw things like this, and I was completely enthusiastic and happy. So I check, I tried to check the, the posterior circulation um, that I did before. This is the injection of the left vertebral artery. And if you see with that tension, you, you can see that in this area, there is a, uh, a few of vessels than in the other area of the, the cerebellum. And I decide to play with the images. This is the venous phase in the, injecting the ascending pharyngeal artery, the neuromeningeal branch. I took out this part of the image 
and I decided to play puzzle and it matched exactly incredible. I did uh, City 3D and uh, Expert City to understand exactly where the artery passed and Maybe I think that the, uh, in this case, <laughs> in this variant, the neuromoninger branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery uh, gives a, a, a branch for posterior meningeal artery passing side by side to the falx of cerebellum. And then, and then he passed through the other side around the torcular and goes down, up, up, uh, downstream the, uh, uh, transverse sinus of the left side of the left side, and then inside the dura, past the dura, and gives branch for the um, posterior inferior uh, cerebellar artery of the other side. It's, it's fantastic, really fantastic in my opinion. So I I thought uh, I, I look back to the MR, and I saw this. I think this is the point in which the, 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 the artery uh, passes through the dura and gives branch for the superior part of the cerebellum of the left side. And I reflect, I reflect, uh, I think about my master <laughs> and it, it is a surprising uh, anatomy variant. No, really not for me. It's just a variant, but it doesn't surprise me at all. It makes me happy because I believe in Dodian theory. The Dodian theory postulates that the vascular system is a pluripotent net that connect any vessel everywhere, always in our life, our life, from the uterus to now to the to the bear. And the progressive use of one of the infinite pathway, one of the infinite net uh, wires within the net is produced by chance, by random, principle of least effort and extent of blood requirement, as my master said before. So in this patient, in this lady, Claudia, one day in utero along his life or later, and by chance, the blood, what's better, the cerebellum got easier to have blood passing through the neuromeningeal branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery, again, in, instead of using other branches, other, the usual uh, way, so left vertebral artery, left subclavian artery, left vertebral artery, basilar, top of the basilar, superior cerebe uh, inferior posterior cerebellar artery. And at the end, it was just one of the infinite, but usual variants of the ascending pharyngeal artery. The same that uh, Eitan showed before for the ophthalmic artery. We are all, all of us are variants. So I think we have finished. Luca, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, okay, so um, Dodi, I know you had some, you have some, uh, we have maybe like five, six minutes. So. I think maybe you want to show if anyone has questions, uh, comments coming up. Maybe we can go a little bit over. You, Dodi, you have some pictures of what this looks like intraoperatively or like on, on, not, an, not an angiogram and maybe any comments? Um, I, I have a comment. I have a comment, Max. Yeah. Yeah, go so, ahead. So one, in, uh, uh, um, one way to interpret this is also the following, in my opinion, Luca. Um, so we always see like the posterior meningeal artery, it's usually, it has a lot of variants, right? Like we can see it coming from like, uh, you know, uh, or going to anywhere, depending on the, your centrifugal or centripetal way, right? Yeah. So, so we see coming from the ascending pharyngeal artery or occipital artery, pica and so forth. In this case, this patient had a dominant posterior meningeal artery coming from the right uh, uh, ascending pharyngeal, which by the way, had a common trunk with the occipital artery. So, as Miguel Litao said, it was like a, 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 oh no, he said something else. But anyway, it was a pharyngo-occipital uh, 
uh, ascending pharyngeal, minor meningeal trunk coming from the uh, occipital artery, as just as a reminder of all the variants. Now, in this case, the posterior meningeal artery was coming from the right. Now, what happens on the left is uh, it seems like it's a, um, it's a sort of like a synangiosis, right? You can think of a synangiosis that uh, like maybe like that part of the cerebellum like needed more like uh, supply and the PL supply failed or, or didn't develop uh, the, the common way, as you said. And so if that area of the cerebellum needs a, a, needs a dural supply for synangiosis, the vessel that finds there is the posterior meningeal artery comes from the right side. So, you know, it's just, I'm not saying anything different from you. I'm just, uh, uh, um, just essentially adding, uh, adding one way to look at this. If the, if the, if the, you know, if the meningeal artery was coming from the, there, from, from the left side, it would be an ipsilateral, but essentially it's the, it's the synangiosis, meningeal to peel, uh, to peel. Yeah. To we see, we, we, we see usually things like this in Moya Moya, when yes. you inject the medial meningeal artery. Yes, I, exactly. It's the same, is exactly. Now in this case, it seems the cerebellum there is normal. The patient is developmentally okay. So, uh, so. But, but the problem is that this lady has no, um, uh, in analysis, no, no pathology of the position. Yeah, yeah, and also the cerebellum looks normal. So, you know, this is a, uh, you know, um, Kitty Pong, have, have we, have we seen um, synangiosis uh, in normal patients in the supratentorial brain? Yes, yeah, supratentorial, uh, yes, uh, it's secondary. What, what you meant is like uh, secondarily developed uh, anastomosis, dural supply. Uh, but this one, I think the, the connection is not that, you know, usually when we have those kind of uh, dural supply, like in when we see in Moya Moya, you, it's kind of like diffuse connections. You cannot de depict one single channel that connects directly. This is like a, a direct bypass, or uh, I don't know what what to uh, how to describe this one, but it's a direct channel from from the dural artery to the pile artery. We have seen one. Uh, Hima was uh, uh, making some comments in the chat uh, that she, she's shown one. Uh, um, here probably some sometimes in 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 spring, uh, it was ipsilateral. I still remember that 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 picture, and I have one case similar to yours, Luca, and it was a little more faint, not that prominent as yours. It's yeah, the you same, uh, yeah, yeah, it's from from the occipital artery f through the mastoid branch, the same uh, pattern to to the. To the thing, uh, so I don't know. There, there must be some something specific in that area that it can go like. We, we, we were having this uh, discussion on the uh, dural branches of pile arteries, uh, like we see from sometimes we see from the ACA to the to the Fox. So this is the probably the 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 reverse of that those kind of connections. Uh, yeah. Not not very. Uh, uh, often seen but uh, it's possible probably the more we look the more we find this type of connection do maybe from people, yeah uh, maybe yeah and this this support the the, the theorem of dodi that always, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think dodi yeah i think dodi gets a point from from this this kind of case yeah we have we don't have a good explanation uh, I, I would say that I think you probably did, but um, it doesn't look like there's an infarct in the cerebellum. But when we look, if there's an orosynangiosis, as you're saying in the moya moya, we look, we have to make sure that, say, there's no dissection in the vert or something like this, an older dissection, perhaps, that maybe an embolus flipped into an yeah. SPD branch and encouraged formation of a synangiosis. So it does like lead us along some ways to like check the angiogram a little bit more. And, but oftentimes, as you say, they, you know, this is this is how it is. Um, Dodi, do you have you have those? Yeah, if Luca esci dal cazzo di schermo, who's that? <laughs> you can take this. Too. There was Italian. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so now you should see my screen. I hope. Uh, and uh, okay, th this is an example I took from uh, from another presentation. So the uh, example of a collateral 
in AVMs after partial embolization. And we have seen many times that uh, after embolization of the, an AVM, uh, the uh, external carotid artery, which before was like this, nothing. After the embolization, you have a development uh, of all the uh, branches. Why? Because uh, blood has to go to the AVM through a different route. And so uh, the small uh, uh, meningeal artery becomes a larger uh, uh, meningeal artery because it has to go there. But so this is not a genesis, which means birth. Sorry, uh, Dodi, can you go back, please? Sure. There's also, we have to say though also here as a limitation as a comparison of these two images. The first one on the left, you probably, probably an injection was done, maybe the catheter was, I don't know, like maybe wedged in, in, a, in a branch, but you, you see, we also don't see the internal maxillary artery. So I'm sure you're right. And, uh, and certainly that's a great point, but. No, no, uh, the, the point here is that it, uh, the image before where there was internal maxillary artery, it, it was such a slow flow because there was no, no need for it that I needed to take a, a, a second image or a third image when you, you, everything was washed out just to see the distal branch of the middle. Yeah, 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 I yeah. see. Okay. So, um, but it's obvious that the, that artery is much, much smaller than, than what it became later. And also you can see that the posterior branch, it's the same, no? Uh, so again, it's not a genesis, so it's not the birth of a new vessel, but it's a growth in size of vessels which are already present. In other case, this is the AVM. After the embolization, you can see the cast here. Now you see better the uh, artery of Bernasconi, which of course was already there before, but it developed afterwards. And the same case, you can see that the menin middle meningeal artery also had become uh, larger and why that red uh, arrows show that one of the branches is larger and the other one did not become larger. So why did the AVM choose one or the other? Of course it's just random. It decided that it was easier one than the other. So how does this happen? Why do we have meningo to pial connections or pial to meningo connections? What is the, let's look at the normal anatomy and to look at the normal anatomy, we probably need to go to surgery. So here at surgery, you can see when you open the dura, you have the dura here, you have the arachnoid there, and what's this? This is just a connecting vessel between the dura and the arachnoid. So it's what surgeons see every, every time. And I have to thank Dr. Emanuela Crobedo for these images uh, again, dura, arachnoid, and the connecting vessel. And the surgeons have to, I hope you can see the, the, the movie here, have to look for this and coagulate them, these bridging vessels, otherwise they bleed. So why? Because there are vessels on them. So there, there are these connections and you can see them very well. You, you can see a little, a little vessel uh, which is uh, going on on the and they have just have to cut them. It's difficult to find these images. Why? Because usually surgeons don't record uh, the opening of the dura. For them, it's just so such a simple and not interesting maneuver that you don't have these uh, usually on recordings. So really, I have to thank uh, Dr. Crobedo for for finding this for me. And and uh, some more. Again, you can see that little thing in the middle. And, and you just have to, to separate uh, the, the dura from, from the brain uh, by con coagulating these vessels. This, I mean, these little off, offsprings, which are, which are uh, vessels dominated. So the message is that there is nothing strange in the derivation of pial arteries from dural arteries or vice versa, which is what we have seen here with the, the case of Luca. And it may happen anywhere because it is a fully interconnected network. <laughs> and thank you very much. That, that was, I, I hope, you know, thank people- you, just, be Beautiful you, videos. Now, are, um, yeah, um, like, can we tell if those are arteries or veins? Can they- Yeah, I, I wanna say, I, can you hear me, Aitan? It's Erez. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanna say, um, 
I I don't find that often this vessel actually. When I open the Dura, you know what? Maybe I don't recognize that, but I don't see a lot of vessels when I open the Dura that are connected really to the Dura. That was very interesting video what you sent. Very interesting. I don't Thank know. You. It's weird. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you just do it without thinking about it. Yeah, because... yeah. You know what? I'm trying to. You know what? Yeah. That's very interesting. I'll go back. I, I record Please. all my videos. I record all my operations. Yeah, or, or the back. next one. The next one you do it is just look at wow. it. Wow. That's what you're very doing. interesting. Dodi, it would also, I guess it would also, we would ask the question of like, what were the indications for the surgeries? Was it like some completely unrelated or was there yeah, any? Of course. Like whatever. Of course. No, no, no. It's, of it, course. But again, once more, just you can do it anytime you open the Dura and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not depending on the, on the pathology. But uh, again, it, surgeons don't even look, they just see blood and they, boof, they coagulate. They, no, okay. maybe, rhinos, maybe, rhinos we, maybe, maybe, maybe we Sorry. think it's arachnoid and there are vessels inside there. That's very But that's the same. I mean, if, if it's, a, it probably is arachnoid, it's, but it's going from, you know, external to internal or, or vice versa. And probably wherever there is a vein, there is an artery, as you know, very well know in, 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 the, in the body. So uh, I, don't, I don't care if it's a vein or an artery. It, it, it's vessels, it's, and vessels are everywhere. I mean, if it's not on that specific branch that you're looking at, on the next one on the right, there will be one. And so if you, it, the blood will, will find that way to come and go from the uh, um, surface of the brain to the dura and vice versa. It's, it's nothing, uh, I, what, what I wanted to show you is that it's nothing surprising. It's, it's there. It's not a genesis. It's not something which is uh, being born. It's already there and it just becomes larger because the flow will, will go there and will keep on going, will keep on going. And then of course the, the vessel will, will become larger. I still like the miracle explanation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. Um, any comments? Anybody else? Um, okay. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, great session. A lot of awesome discussion. Thank you, everybody. We will. Um, so, thanks all again, everyone. Uh, Eitan, especially for a tremendous amount of work on this. Um, we will um, be meeting again on the second uh, Tuesday of January. Um, topic. We'll send out a topic shortly. Um, but um, thanks for coming. And of course, the recording is going to be there. Um, um, we'll, uh, we'll see you later. Stay safe and happy holidays to everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.